The visitor pattern is often praised for its flexibility, but let's face it, implementing it can feel clunky, verbose, and at times unnecessarily complex. But what if there was a simpler way to achieve the same results? A way that's not only easier to write and maintain, but also significantly faster. In this video, we'll explore a streamlined, high-performance alternative to the visitor pattern. One that plays well with Rust's core principles, without sacrificing clarity or maintainability. We work out why we needed the visitor pattern in the first place, find a more simple and performant way to achieve the same goal, compare both approaches, run a benchmark and help you decide when to stick with tradition and when to embrace simplicity. My name is Max, this is Green Tea Coding. Let's get started. To start things off, let's remind ourselves of what a very simple implementation of the visitor pattern looks like in Rust. For this time, and this time only, I will take the very academic example of visiting shapes. This is so that everybody can easily follow and we don't have any clutter on this example. So shape is a trait which only defines one method, which is accept. And what does it accept? Well, a dynamically resolved visitor. So this is the dynamic dispatch that everyone is talking about when they talk about the visitor pattern. And because the shape accepts the visitor, it is the visitable. We have three kinds of shapes, all implemented as a struct. We have a circle with a radius. A rectangle requires two members, which is the width and the height. And of course, we have the square with the side. All the implementations of shape for these individual shapes look very much the same. What they do is they accept the visitor and then call their respective specialized function on the visitor. So the circle calls visit circle, the rectangle calls visit rectangle, and so on. The visitor trait, of course, then defines those three methods. So visit circle, visit square, and visit a rectangle. And in our shape operations, we actually have the implementation of a visitor. So the area calculator itself doesn't need any state, but it implements the visitor trait. So for example, if we visit a circle, of course we know how to calculate the area of a circle and we will just print that out here. Same for a square with a different formula and for the rectangle. If we then go to the main function, we see that I created a vector of box shapes here. This vector contains a circle, a square, and a rectangle. And this is, by the way, the only reason I use the trait shape, or I have the trait shape at all, is to put them together in the same collection. If we were okay with treating those shapes, the circle, the square, and the rectangle individually, there wouldn't be a reason we need to define the shape trait. Next thing is we create an area calculator, which is an instance of our visitor. And then we can iterate through all of our shapes and just accept them so that the error calculator can do its job. If we then run the code, we can see, of course, the visitor pattern does what it's supposed to do. It calculates the area. This was a very, very quick rundown of what the visitor pattern actually does. If you'd like a deep dive on implementing the visitor pattern, I suggest you watch my dedicated video on it. What you see here is a schematic representation of the code we just saw. Before we dive into the alternative, let's quickly recap why the visitor pattern is such a popular choice in the first place. Number one, it separates behavior from structure. The visitor pattern allows you to define new operations on an existing data structure without modifying the definitions. This is especially useful when you want to extend functionality in a clean, organized way. Secondly, it leverages polymorphism for flexibility. By using dynamic dispatch, you can write visitors that work across different types in a hierarchy, making it easier to adapt and scale your design. And third, it keeps your code base organized. Instead of scattering logic across multiple classes or modules, visitors centralize it, which can make your code easier to read and maintain. With these properties, the visitor pattern addresses a core problem of type hierarchies. Let's take a look at the type hierarchy we used for the visitor code, but envision it without this pattern. 
So the functionality is now tightly coupled to the structs, and a base trait defines the functionality every type has to provide. When functionality is coupled to types, adding a new type to the hierarchy is typically painless, as it requires no modification of already existing types. But adding new functionality to a base type, in this case our shape trait, often causes rippling changes across all derived classes. The same of course goes for modifying existing functionality. This can quickly lead to a maintenance nightmare as your codebase grows. This problem often appears in traditional OOP approaches of course because of inheritance, but it is also prevalent in Rust as you can see from this example. The visitor pattern flips this around. Adding new functionality is straightforward. Just add a new visitor struct and implement the logic without touching the existing data structures. But when you add a new type to the hierarchy, suddenly every visitor function must be adapted to handle that new type. And don't forget that the underlying visitor trait also has to expand. It is a trade-off. Flexibility in behavior at the cost of needing to update existing functions when your structure evolves. But let's cut to the chase now. In spite of all its strength, the visitor pattern isn't always the best fit. In Rust, its reliance on dynamic dispatch and its boilerplate-heavy implementation can feel out of place, especially when there's a simpler, faster way to achieve the same result. Let's take a look at pattern matching. When we want to solve the same problem of calculating the area of shapes, we have to start in a radically different way. This time we won't define our shapes as structs, but all of them are defined in the same enum called shape. And of course enums in Rust can hold different data, so the variants can have different data. That's why a circle can hold one F64 for the radius, a square also only holds its side length, but a rectangle can hold its height and its width both at the same time. In order to implement our operations, this is very straightforward. We just have a public function, a free function called calc area, which takes a shape and then matches on the variant of the shape. So if it's a circle, we store its radius in a local variable and then calculate the area and print it out on the console. Same thing for the square and for the rectangle. So this is super basic and super efficient stuff that you can do in Rust. The main function also looks extremely clean, right? We have a vector of shapes, again, same numbers that we had before, a circle, a square, and a rectangle. And then we just call calc area on the shapes, and we should be getting the very same results. Let us just quickly make sure that that's the case. And of course, we got the same results as before. Rust's enums are a perfect fit for pattern matching. Enums in Rust are a form of algebraic data types, types that can represent one of several different values, each potentially with its own data. This makes them incredibly powerful for modeling complex data structures. Pattern matching allows you to destructure these enums effortlessly, matching on the specific variants and extracting the associated data in a clean, readable way. The combination of enums and pattern matching in Rust gives you a powerful, type-safe way to handle different possibilities while keeping the code concise and performant. This approach is much cleaner than what you can see in other languages where reflection is used to match on class types in an inheritance hierarchy, as this often relies on runtime checks and costly introspection. With Rust's pattern matching, you get compile time checks for exhaustiveness, ensuring you handle every possible case explicitly and safely without needing to worry about missing or invalid variants. At their core, both the visitor pattern and pattern matching share the same goal. They provide a way to operate on different types in a structured and extensible way. Both approaches respect the type hierarchy of your data and help you avoid littering your code base with conditional logic spread across multiple places. These patterns make it straightforward to add new functionality without modifying the types they operate on. But here's where they differ. The visitor pattern relies on dynamic polymorphism using traits and dynamic dispatch to separate behavior from structure. In contrast, pattern matching leverages static polymorphism, resolving everything at compile time, which makes it faster and often simpler to implement in Rust. However, pattern matching shares much of the visitor's characteristics. Adding new functionality adheres to the open-close principle, as no changes to any existing code have to be made. 
but adding a new type to the hierarchy comes with changes to all existing functionalities, as the match statements have to be updated to account for the new type. So while it solves the same problem as the visitor, pattern matching feels more natural in Rust, playing to its strengths of performance, type safety and minimal boilerplate. The visitor pattern's reliance on dynamic dispatch introduces a runtime cost. It trades speed for flexibility. On the other hand, pattern matching benefits from Rust's static polymorphism, where everything is resolved at compile time, making it inherently faster. But just how big is the difference? To find out, I've set up a benchmark to put these two approaches to the test. Let's dive into the numbers and see what the data tells us. In order to do a proper performance comparison between the visitor pattern and pattern matching, I set up a benchmark case that mainly does one thing, which is calling the visiting functions. So not much else is going on. I wanted to really focus in on that. Therefore, I did a very few changes. Number one is our calc area function in the pattern matching now returns an F64 rather than just printing things onto the console, because printing things onto the console is extremely expensive compared to what we're doing here, and that would really butcher our results. So now we're just returning this area. And in order to make Rust really work without the compiler optimizing everything away, what I'm doing is I'm generating random numbers between 0.5 and 1.5, and then I create a lot of shapes which are five circles, five squares, and five rectangles with this random number. So only generating the number once, because I don't know, that might be expensive as well. But then create the vector of shapes, and then I'll run my loop, of course, and create the sum of all the areas. And this is a function I created. Then we have a second function, which is called run in time. It takes as input the first function and a number of iterations to run this thing. And what it does, it's creating the random number generator, initializing the sum variable, and then measuring the time between start and end. And we'll just run this loop for the given number of iterations, print the duration, and the sum. So what was important here is that we do have this random number generation, otherwise we would do the same computation over and over again and then the compiler would just optimize it away. So now let's run this thing. Of course, we're gonna run this in release mode, otherwise the comparison would not be fair. So first run, it takes around four and a half milliseconds, then four milliseconds, 4.08, 4.06. So that's our baseline of our pattern matching code, okay? Around four milliseconds, maybe a third higher. In total analogy, of course, I set up our visitor pattern as well, just so you can check that our shape operations now also return an F64. And of course, in the main function, I run this for a million times and time it. Just the same thing. So let's see where this one goes. Wow, 277 milliseconds on the first run. Let's see a few more, 276, 280, Again, around 280. So that's a whole lot of a difference that we get there compared to the pattern matching approach. So we saw that pattern matching massively outperforms the visitor pattern. It is in principle easier to read and write, and the compiler supports us in terms of exhaustiveness. So surely there is no need for the visitor pattern anymore, right? Right? Well, you might be surprised that while pattern matching is often faster and simpler in Rust, the visitor pattern still has its place. And in some cases, it is the better choice. In terms of performance and simplicity, we already saw that those two categories go towards pattern matching. Let's take a look at extensibility, though. When adding a new type to the hierarchy, the visitor classes only need to be extended, while updating the match statements of pattern matching imply a modification of every function working on the hierarchy. Therefore, pattern matching violates the open-close principle, as adding a new type to the hierarchy requires you to modify existing match statements. On a similar note, the visitor pattern provides a clearer separation of the operation logic from the data structure, 
whereas the mesh statements are typically intermingled with the actual functionality. Now let us take a look at flexibility. And here I would first like to highlight the structs versus enums topic. Pattern matching only works on enums, but in the rest of your code, structs can often be easier to deal with than enums. For example, if you want to access data stored in an enum, you have to match on it first, while you can directly access struct members. Enums also introduce complexity and mental overhead, and of course, an enum always requires as much memory as its largest variant, which might lead to performance overhead if your variants vary strongly in size. As a final thought for structs versus enums, you could also wrap structs in a common enum to leverage the power of pattern matching, but that seems like a bit of a forced solution to me. A further thought on flexibility. The visitor pattern can work on totally unrelated structs. We only added the shape trait so that we can treat the different shapes in a common way and store them in a vector. But strictly speaking, the shape trait was not required to make the visitor pattern work. For pattern matching, you always need to resort to variants of the same enum. So overall, the visitor pattern excels when extensibility is a priority. If you need to add new operations to a stable data structure without modifying its existing code, the visitor pattern makes that easy. Also, it's a good fit for complex type hierarchies, especially when you need to centralize behavior for a wide range of types in one place. And last but not least, it's useful in cross-language contexts or when working with patterns from object-oriented design. If your team is more familiar with OOP principles or you're integrating with systems designed around those paradigms, the visitor pattern can be the more natural choice. On the flip side, use pattern matching when you need performance or if you prefer simplicity. Whenever your type hierarchy is small and there is not a lot of coupling to other parts of the code, you should also consider pattern matching over visitors. And we're done. We've explored pattern matching as a powerful, high-performance alternative to the visitor pattern, one that aligns perfectly with Rust's principles. But we also saw how a seemingly outdated OOP design pattern can be the best choice in some cases. At the end of the day, the best tool is the one that fits your problem. Understanding this pattern gives you only the flexibility to choose the right approach for the job. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe for more advanced software design and Rust content. And if you have any questions or ideas, let's chat down in the comments. I'd love to hear your thoughts. I'll see you next time with Green Decoding.